Latin school. Uh, he then got his undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He went on to get a master's degree from MIT, but he, perhaps he's best known for being an international expert on homeland security, national security, cybersecurity, and counterterrorism. Twenty years ago, that perhaps was not a big thing, but today it is the number one topic throughout the country and throughout the world. He's an on-air consultant for ABC News constantly. He has taught at the Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government, uh, and he's been recognized by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top global thinkers of 2010. Perhaps, though, one of his most interesting and I think shows a lot of durability and determination. He spent 19 years in the Pentagon, intelligence community, and the State Department, and 10 consecutive years working for three different presidents in the White House. That's very, very unusual. The normal term of office is around 27 months for an ambassador or a secretary or anybody who is a confirmed person within the White House. He spent 10 consecutive years working for a Democrat and two Republicans in the White House. He's written two books. The first one, Against All Enemies, Inside America's War on Terror, What Really Happened? And his most recent book, in which you must read, is Cyber War, the first book really w written about the war of the future. It's our normal practice for our speakers to receive an honorarium, uh, but Dick decided not to accept the honorarium. He asked that the honorarium be given back and help the students within the honors colloquium and the honors program. So will you please welcome a great man, a great patriot, a great American, Dick Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. I actually stayed working at the White House for 10 years because no one told me you could quit. Uh, but then one day, George Bush decided to invade Iraq, and I thought it probably was time to quit. The topic tonight is cyberspace. And it's a little challenging to talk to an audience like this about cyberspace because some of you have PhDs in information science. And admit it, some of you can barely turn on your computer. So for those of you who can barely turn on your computer, forgive me if I get a little geeky. And for those of you with the PhDs in information science, I will say up front, you know a lot more than I do. But what I want to do is try to explain what's been going on for the last couple of years. I think it's really two years that things have been a little different in cyberspace. And to say what that means for you as an individual here in Rhode Island, uh, and where all this is going in the future. Uh, and that's the, the iffy part. But if you, if you just listen to the TV news, and I'm part of that, I know, uh, or you read the newspaper, you've seen all year long stories of major organizations getting hacked, or as the press likes to call it, attacked uh, in cyberspace. And they're big companies, like Citibank, Lockheed Martin, Sony. Sony got hacked three times, and it admits it cost them over $170 million to repair the damages. So, these are not small organizations. The Defense Department, the Defense Department's classified network, uh, the French finance ministry, the German chancellor, the Australian prime minister, I mean, it goes on and on. And when you hear about it in the press, it's all kind of mushed up together. That hackers are doing attacks. Well, let me try to disaggregate that a little, because I really think there are four different things going on. And for us to understand what's happening malevolently in cyberspace, I think we really need to break it down. So at the risk of being a little um, pedantic here, let me define four different things. I hate PowerPoint, and so there's no PowerPoint tonight. I see I'm not the only one. But I want you to, to imagine. <laughs> See, this way you get to use your minds. 
in your imagination. I want you to imagine a Venn diagram with four circles. And across the four circles, the word CHEW, C-H-E-W. And that's the first letter of the four things that I think are going on. The first is crime. Crime in cyberspace. It's been going on for a very long time, and what it has been so far, until recently, uh, is people stealing money by getting your credit card number. And sometimes they hack into credit card processing companies, and they get a million, ten million credit card numbers at a whack. Sometimes uh, they'll hack into one company, or they'll hack your particular identity and get your card. Uh, and that's pretty much what it's been for the last ten years. And it hasn't been all that bad for you as an individual. How many of you have had your credit card number stolen? Yeah, all right. Half the audience. And has it cost any one of you a penny? No. At least you don't think so, right? Because the bank has always said when you complained that you really weren't in Shanghai that day, the bank has already always said, yeah, well, we believe you and you don't have to pay. Well, the banks lose money by doing that. They're losing a lot of money by doing that. And banks have this tricky way of getting their money back. <laughs> and so while they're not making you pay for the stuff that you didn't buy in Shanghai that day, uh, you may have noticed that you're paying all sorts of other fees that you weren't paying before on your debit card and on your checking account and every time you want to do anything at all on your ATM machine. You know, the funny thing about fees on your ATM machine is it actually is in the bank's interest for you to use the ATM machine. Because if you go into the bank and do the transaction with a teller in a brick-and-mortar building, it costs them about seven or eight bucks to do a transaction. And if you do that tr same transaction, at an ATM machine, it costs them between 10 cents and 25 cents. But they charge you two or three dollars. So they are kind of making up for the losses uh, in the credit cards. But cybercrime has now gone beyond <coughs> simply stealing identities and stealing credit cards. Now what's happening is people are hacking into companies, including medium-sized companies, and taking over the identity of the comptroller or the treasurer of the company. And then they make themselves the recipient of accounts payable. In other words, they become a vendor to the company, and they write themselves a check for $150,000, $250,000, which they then wire to themselves. And this all happens at night, and the treasurer or the comptroller of the company comes in in the morning, and may or may not notice that an account payable has been paid and the $250,000 has gone to a bank account in the Cayman Islands. This was happening a great deal in the last two years, and the FBI was able to bust a group that was doing it. The FBI gave this case name Core Flood. And I'm going to be using FBI case names throughout. The FBI has this cute little habit of giving cases names so they can remember them. So this one is Core Flood. And the money was all going to bank accounts in the Cayman Islands and staying in those accounts for less than a minute. As soon as it hit the bank account in the Cayman Islands, it would be wire transferred to an account in Romania, and from Romania to Russia, and from Russia to Belarus, and from Belarus to the Ukraine, and eventually people would lose the trace. But it's not just credit cards. It's stealing money in every way imaginable online. And you say, well, that's okay as long as I'm not the person who's being hit. Well, it's not, because all of this money adds up. In fact, according to the U.S. Treasury Department, all of these organized crime groups that are stealing money online now make more money than the drug cartels. Now, we all know the drug cartels are making billions of dollars on cocaine and, and heroin. Now, for the first time in the last couple of years, 
their revenue, total revenue of drug cartels in the world, has been outpaced by the revenue from the cyber gangs, the cyber criminals. Now, they don't have body bags on the road side in Mexico. You know, you know, they don't shoot it out in Tijuana the, the way the drug cartels do. So they don't get the same amount of attention in the media. But this is billions of dollars. With these billions of dollars, they are going out, these criminal cartels, and renting, hiring, the best computer scientists they can find. And so they now have extremely sophisticated techniques of hacking into computer systems in order to steal money. Why can't we arrest them? It's not because the FBI doesn't do a good job. It's not because the Secret Service doesn't do a good job, because both FBI and Secret Service investigate these crimes in cyberspace. It's because when they do their computer forensics, and by the way, some of the best computer forensic experts in the country are here at URI, when they do the computer forensics and find out how the attack occurred and where the attack occurred, and you start tracing back the source of the attack, they're always pretending to be somebody else, and they're always trying to hide their tracks. But when you follow them all the way back, they end up in Russia. Or the other countries that used to be the Soviet Union, Belarus, Ukraine, other East European countries like Romania. And when the FBI goes to those countries and says, hey, we need your help tracing this robbery, this theft, this criminal gang, well, the local police are always very helpful to the criminals. Now, I know I'm cynical and jaded because I've lived in Washington a long time, but I suspect that maybe some of those police in Russia and the Ukraine and Belarus and Romania, maybe they get a little Christmas present from these cyber criminals. Maybe they have an understanding with some of these cyber criminals. The head of the uh, Romanian intelligence service was at one of our classes at Harvard, and we were talking about this, and he said, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. You cannot trust these cyber criminals. I had to deal with them that they would never hack in Romania. These countries are, in effect, cyber sanctuaries. You know, we talk about Pakistan as a sanctuary for the Taliban, and the U.S. troops get attacked in Afghanistan, and then the attackers run over the border back into Pakistan, where they have a sanctuary. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. We're all being attacked, American companies, American credit card organizations, American citizens, are being attacked in cyberspace, the money is being taken, and it's going to these countries that are, in effect, cyber sanctuaries. And as you'll see in a minute, when we talk about cyber war, some of these criminal cartels, as part of their deal with the local authorities, are also kind of reserve forces for these nations to fight cyber war. You remember the movie The Godfather? where it's his daughter, the godfather's uh, daughter's wedding day. And various people come to him and ask for favors. You remember this? And he grants favors on his daughter's wedding day. But he says to each of these people, I will grant you the favor, but someday I will make a special request. And I expect you to honor it. Well, that's what happens with these cyber criminals. They do the deal with the local police. And the local police say, don't hack in our country, it'll be fine. Give me 10% of the take, it'll be fine. But someday I may ask you for special favors. Do a little hacking for the government. Talk about that in a minute. So the C in CHU is cyber crime, and it's gotten to be big business in the last couple of years on a global scale. The H in CHU is a new phenomenon, I think, in the last two years called hacktivism. Hacktivism are hackers not motivated by money. 
they're motivated by a political agenda. Uh, and maybe that agenda is, in the case of WikiLeaks, uh, they believe that there should not, not be secrets, that the government should not have secrets. Now, in general, you know, I believe in open government too, but there have to be some secrets. And the hacktivists, at least in the case of WikiLeaks, have been systematically trying to break in to governments around the country and around the world and expose their secrets. They were very successful when they got an army private named Manning, Private Manning, uh, who worked in a facility where he had access to a secret network. And every day, he would go to work carrying a couple of blank CDs. And his sergeant asked him one day, what are you doing with these blank CDs all the time? And he said, well, a lot of my friends like Lady Gaga. And every day I copy my Lady Gaga songs onto a CD for my friends. I'm just copying music. And his sergeant said, oh, yeah, OK, fine. What he was doing was every day he was going on the secret Pentagon network and downloading tens of thousands of secret documents. Overall, we think he downloaded 450,000 secret documents. And then he gave them to WikiLeaks that put them online in order to advance their political agenda that there shouldn't be secrets. Well, some of those secrets were things we were doing to go after Al-Qaeda. And governments that were cooperating with us around the world to go after Al-Qaeda. And those governments aren't cooperating with us anymore because they got caught out, they got embarrassed, they had lied to their people. And now it's a little bit more difficult to do that counterterrorism work because governments don't believe that if they talk to the United States anymore, the United States can keep a secret. And, you know, in the intelligence business and in diplomacy, you have to have trust that the person you're talking to from the United States if you're giving them classified secret information, you have to have trust that they'll keep that information secret. And that trust was blown by WikiLeaks. There are other hacktivist groups, groups that have great motivation, that are pro-environment, against pollution, uh, and other similar causes, and they hack their way into companies and get their records and put them online. So, hacktivism is a new phenomenon. It's not crime, although it technically violates the law. Uh, it's people using hacking techniques for a political cause or a political agenda. That's the H. The E in CHU is the one I think you need to worry about. I think we all need to worry about. And it's espionage. In this case, cyber espionage. There's a joke in the intelligence business that uh, espionage is the world's second oldest profession. And certainly it's been around forever. But espionage used to be a really dangerous and tricky thing to do. Think about it. Go back to the Cold War days. And let's say you are the head Russian spy in Washington. Your job is to steal files from the Pentagon, the State Department, the FBI, the CIA. And the way you do that in those days was to guess who it was that was working at the CIA who would become a traitor for money. You had to guess who was the right person that you could suborn. If you guessed the wrong person, you'd get arrested. So it was a very difficult job, but yet they succeeded. They found a guy, an American citizen at the CIA, who for money, every day would take a, a secret document and put it in his shoe and walk out of the CIA with a secret document. And when he got a pile of about 50 of them, he would bury them in a park in Virginia, and then the Russians would come along and dig them up. Very dangerous for everybody involved. And at the end of the day, the Russians got, you know, 50 documents. That was espionage. 
Cyber espionage isn't about 50 documents, it's about 50 million documents. The losses now are talked about in terms of terabytes. Terabytes meaning multiple libraries of Congress filled with documents. Now when there's a cyber espionage attack on an American company or a government building, we lose two and a half times all of the knowledge in the Library of Congress on the average attack. Volumes, volumes of information going out the door. And it's no longer just a matter of hacking into the Pentagon and the State Department and the CIA and the FBI. No, where they're hacking now is research institutions, nuclear laboratories, universities that do research, and American companies that do research. What they're stealing are chemical formulas, engineering designs, any intellectual property. It's not just the designs of fighter planes, it's the designs of new running shoes. It's the designs of new iPads, the designs of new pharmaceuticals. Why? Think about it. The United States is engaged in a global economic competition, largely against China. And what advantage do we have over China? China has much lower wages, many more people, less government regulation. How can we compete with them? Well, because we have innovation. We have research and development. We have creativity. We've got the greatest university system in the world and the greatest series of research laboratories in the world. And they're funded, the research is funded, to the tunes of tens, hundreds of billions of dollars a year by taxpayers through federal government grants, the NSF and DARPA and others, and by stockholders, companies spending their own money on research. What happens now is that all of that money is spent on research. And when the research is done, China, sometimes Russia, but usually China, will hack their way into the research laboratory and steal the results of the research. Now, we've paid, in some cases, one case I know of a billion dollars in research at one laboratory that was stolen. We paid a billion dollars for that one piece of research over the course of three years. It's gone, China has it, and they spent nothing on it. And they now have every piece of knowledge that we have on that piece of research. And then they go out and they produce a product. Frequently they produce the product before we produce the product. And they certainly produce it at a lower price. You wonder why we have 9% unemployment? It's because so many jobs are moving to China, not be just because American factories are moving to China, but because China is stealing American intellectual property by the libraries of Congress full and sending it over there and giving it to their own companies. Now, when I like to talk about espionage, people usually say to me in the question period, well, doesn't the United States engage in espionage too? You betcha, we do. But we do not steal from private companies abroad and turn around and give it to American companies here. We don't. You know, it might be a great idea. Maybe we should, you know, hack our way into the European Airbus company and steal the designs for the A380 and give it to Boeing. See if they can make one. But we don't do that. It's in violation of all the international agreements on international trade. And we tend to live up to the agreements that we sign. But this is a really significant problem on the economic front. On the military front, it's also a really significant problem. The F-35 fighter plane is going to be our new fighter plane. It's going to enter service shortly. 
and it's going to be our fighter plane for the next 20 years. Before it was ever in service, the design for the F-35 was hacked and stolen, probably by China. Now, what does that mean? They're going to go off and build F-35s? Well, yeah, it might mean that. But it might mean also that if we ever get into a war in the future, that the enemies around the world will know how our weapons work. And worse yet, they may have put things into the software of our weapons so that when we try to go to battle, the weapons don't work. If you can imagine the United States military trotting out onto the battlefield, thinking it has technological superiority, and then the things don't work. We know the Pentagon's secret network was compromised. And we know how it was done, and we know who did it. The Russian Secret Service bought a bunch of thumb drives, you know, those little flash drives that you put in your USB part of your computer, and they scattered them around outside of army bases, thinking that eventually someone Someone in the U.S. Army would pick one up and use it on their home computer, and then take it from their home computer to a classified network, and then back again. And that happened. We don't know how many times it happened, but it happened enough that it allowed the Russians to penetrate the Pentagon's secret level network. So when you leave here tonight and you see those flash drives in the parking lot, <laughs> might want to leave them on the ground. So defending our cyberspace has become a big business. And there are a lot of American companies that make money just by selling cybersecurity. One of them is a company in Massachusetts, not far from here, called RSA. RSA makes a little token that has a random number generator on it. Anybody ever use one of these RSA tokens? So here's how it works. You log in with your username and your password, but that can be hacked. So to add an additional layer of security, you have to look at your little fob, your little device, and type in the number that's appearing at that moment. And the number is eight digits, and it changes every minute. And back at the central office, they know what number should be appearing for you at that time. So it's a really sophisticated piece of math, and it really improves security. And hackers were trying to get in to some companies, like the big aerospace company Lockheed Martin, and they couldn't get in because they were using this RSA token, this additional layer of security. So what do you do if you're a hacker and you can't get in because the RSA token is there? You hack RSA. What happened earlier this year was that a lot of people working at RSA got an email from a woman who was working in HR at RSA. They used the real name of a real person in the HR department. That's what it looked like on the from line. And then they sent it to all sorts of people at RSA, and they got their names and their emails online from Facebook, from LinkedIn, from Plaxo, from all of these places, social media sites where people say, I work for RSA. OK. So now hundreds of people in the company get an email from someone apparently in the company. And it says, attached is an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it has the plans for something or other. Uh, I need your comments by the end of the week. Click. Well, if you clicked it, and who wouldn't, it launched an attack on the entire network. What did the, it's a very smart little thing that was launched. What the attack software did was, first of all, it made itself the systems administrator for the whole network. It then gave itself all privileges on the network. It then created a nice little workspace for itself on one of the servers. 
and it then sent probes out all over the company looking for the secret sauce behind this random number generator. It found it, it pulled it back into the workspace, it then compressed it into a bunch of little files, it then encrypted all of those little files using its own encryption algorithm, and it then sent them all off to China. It then erased, or at least it thought it did, erased all record of this ever having happened. Thankfully, they weren't smart enough to do that part well. So the computer forensics groups have figured out what happened. But you've got to feel sorry for the people who were attacked. I mean, look, if you got a, let's say you work here at the university, and you get an email from someone you know is working here at the university, it's got their name on it, and it's got your appropriate university address, and it says, I need your comments on something that reasonably you might want to comment on, how many of you are going to say, gee, I better not click on that attachment from Peter. Instead, I better call Peter and say, did you send me this thing and should I really open the attachment? No, you're not going to do that. Come on, you're really not going to do that. You may say, well, I'm too busy to open the attachment. But if you send it to 100 people, a couple of them are going to open the attachment. That is the level of sophistication that's going on today, where they're combining social engineering, which is the, the business of sending you an email that looks credible with real names and real language, with really sophisticated software which is the probes going out over the network and taking control of the network. That's cyber espionage. There are 14 U.S. intelligence agencies. Can you believe that? 14, and they all got together two weeks ago and issued a report on cyber espionage. Public report, you can go home tonight and download it. It's the NCIX, I know that sounds like a TV show, the NCIX report on cyber espionage in the United States. And what it says in a public document is that every major company in the United States has been successfully penetrated by cyber espionage. I talk to a lot of companies that go in to clean up the mess after companies have been penetrated. I talk to a lot of computer experts who go in and check out the health of companies. Every company they check has already been penetrated. The Secret Service did a survey. They took 90 companies that had been breached, and they asked those 90 companies if they knew they had been breached. Almost 70 of the 90 didn't know that they had been breached. But, they had been, and when the forensics was done, they admitted it. Terabytes of information going out the door. The head of the British Secret Service, MI5, sent a letter to the top 300 companies in the United Kingdom. And that letter said to the CEO of each of these companies, you must assume that your corporate network has been penetrated by intelligence sources from China or Russia. Now, we haven't sent that letter out to all the CEOs in America yet, but that NCIX report last week, two weeks ago, essentially says that. Every network is penetrated. Any information that was of any value is gone. And it's even information that is temporal in nature, transactional information. For example, there was an oil field in Iraq, a new area that had never been developed. And the new Iraqi government decided to auction off the oil field to oil companies to develop. Exxon, Total, FINA, all the big oil companies around the world bid to get this oil field. And to win, you had to have the highest bid. That's kind of a game theory thing where you don't want to bid too much because you have to make some profit. 
but you want to be the highest bid. So you guess, what's Total going to bid? What's FINA going to bid? And I'll make my bid just a little bit more. Well, a week before the bids were due, all of those major oil companies were hacked. Oh, except one. The company that won the auction. The Chinese Petroleum Company. Even quick transactional information like that, that's of value one day and not of value the next day, is gone. That's the E, the big E in CHU, cyber espionage. The W in CHU is cyber war. And that's also the title of my book, which you can buy on Amazon. <laughs> and when I wrote the book Cyber War, a lot of people said, you're making it up. There's never going to be a cyber war. It's all fiction. You're exaggerating. So let me talk about a few things that have happened since we published the book Cyber War. In Maryland, the United States government raised the flag at a new military command, a US military command, called Cyber Command. It is 21,000 people. It has an army unit an Air Force unit, a Navy unit. You know, the Navy is divided into fleets. There's the Seventh Fleet in Asia and the Sixth Fleets in the Mediterranean. Now we have the Navy has the Tenth Fleet. The Tenth Fleet is in cyberspace. The Tenth Fleet has no ships, no missiles. It fights in cyberspace. Two weeks ago, the Pentagon admitted for the first time that I always kind of thought this was obvious. Cyber Command is designed to attack other countries. So if there's no such thing as cyber war, why do we have a cyber command? What is cyber war? What happens? A lot of people think they, they saw that movie, The Matrix, several years ago with the ones and zeros and the, and the green numbers floating in the air. And they think that cyber war is somehow ones and zeros fighting each other in some fourth dimension. Now, cyber war is war. In war, countries blow things up in other countries. That's what I'm talking about. Cyber war is using not bombs and bullets, but bits and bytes to blow things up in other countries. To prove that you could do this, Several years ago, we took a, an electric generator, one of those big power generators that's on the electric grid, and in Idaho. And we hooked it up to a pretend network of an electric power company. And we had some hackers, without any help, without any inside information, hack their way into the electric power company, public website, from the public website into the internal network of the electric power company, and then look around to find the path over to the control network for the generator. Then they gave the generator commands to spin at the wrong speed. All generators in this country spin at 60 hertz. If you're spinning at any other speed and you plug the generator into the grid, it'll explode. It'll jump right off at stanchions, it'll give out smoke, it'll fly apart. And if you don't believe me, you can go to YouTube and watch this happening. Because the experiment that was conducted in Idaho Falls is now available for watching on YouTube. And you see the generator literally falling apart. Not because of a bomb or a bullet or a missile, but because of a cyber command. And people say, oh, OK, fine, that was an experiment, and that was done in a controlled environment. All right, let's take the Iranian nuclear program. See some people shaking their heads. They know what's coming here. I'm talking about a worm. And remember, all these worms have names. I don't know who gives them their names. This worm's named Stuxnet, S-T-U-X-N-E-T. -E the Iranians thought that we might attack their plant with a cyber attack. 
So they disconnected their nuclear enrichment plant at Natanz from cyberspace. There are no lines running into this plant. No cyber lines, no telephone lines, no way of getting in from the internet. And what's going on inside the plant is that they had 1,000 centrifuges. Centrifuges are like big blenders, only you're not making margaritas with them. You're putting uranium in the blender and spinning it so that the weapons-grade uranium you need to make a nuclear bomb comes out. You get a very little bit from each one, but you put them all together and you get a nuclear weapon. There was a lot of talk that the United States or maybe Israel would send cruise missiles over and blow up the plant. Or maybe a B-1 bomber would fly overhead and blow up the plant. None of that happened. But all 1,000 centrifuges that were online at the time were destroyed. Somehow, somebody got this worm called Stuxnet into the internal network of the Iranian plant. And when it woke up, the worm said, where am I? Am I in the right place? And to find out, it asked, is the software that's running this ne local network from Siemens? Yes. Is it Siemens Windows 7 software? Yes. Is that software controlling an electric motor system that's spinning a centrifuge? Yes. OK, good, I'm going to destroy it. <laughs> and that's what Stuxnet did. It gave speed control orders to the generators, to the electric motors, speed up, slow down, go backwards, until all 1,000 of these things were destroyed, physically destroyed, fell apart, had to be replaced. That attack probably cost the Iranian nuclear program a year. They're back at it now. But for a year, that brilliant little piece of software, 50,000 lines of code, not little, slowed down the Iranians. And you think your taxpayer dollars don't buy you anything. <laughs> but Stuxnet, even though it is an inanimate object, even though it is just lines of code, uh, disobeyed its orders. In the code, or orders for it to kill itself. It had a time to live. And its time to live expired after it did its deed. Somehow, I know this is getting a little silly here, but somehow it escaped and got into cyberspace and started infecting other computers throughout the world. Now, that's not a problem because remember, when it wakes up, it asks itself, are you running Siemens 7? Are you connecting to a centrifuge? And since most of us aren't making nuclear weapons, it's not a problem if somehow Stuxnet gets onto your computer network? Well, it is, in some respects, a problem. Because now, again, you can go home tonight and download, after you watch the videotape of the Idaho thing blowing up, you can move on and you can Google Stuxnet, and if you're pretty good at it, you can find the actual code for Stuxnet and download it onto your computer. So you, too, will have the world's most sophisticated cyber attack weapon ever used available to you. Yeah, people got it. People, hackers around the world, got the software because their machines were infected. Then they posted it on the internet. So this very sophisticated attack tool that had four zero-day attacks in it, had digital certificates in it, and encryption algorithms in it that probably cost millions of dollars to develop is now available to any hacker who wants to download it and use it to attack, say, the electric power grid. The thing about cyber war is that you can attack control systems that run things like the electric power grid, water and sewage systems, gas pipelines, railroads, aviation, and you can give erroneous orders. And the result of those erroneous orders is, if you do it right, 
that things blow up. That's why we have a cyber command. It is also why 25 other nations now have cyber commands. So that in the future, if they want to attack us, they can do it in cyberspace. The Iranians don't have missiles that will reach here. But they do have bits and bytes that can reach here. Crazy regimes like North Korea could never attack the United States before. But they do, even the North Koreans, have cyber attack capability. So in the future, terrorist groups or nation states can use cyber weapons to attack. And they can use cyber weapons to make it easier for their regular weapons to attack. In the opening pages of the book Cyber War, I describe an incident in which Israel decided to blow up a nuclear plant in Syria. Syria was secretly building nuclear weapons, and the Israelis decided to blow up the plant. The only problem was that Syria had tremendous air defense, radars and missiles, and the Israelis wondered how many airplanes they would lose flying into Syria to bomb this plant. Well, when the Israelis flew into Syria to bomb the plant, the Syrians, as they are all the time, were at the radar, looking at the radar screens, and the radar screens were showing no airplanes. No airplanes in the sky. The sky is clear. If the Syrians had only opened the windows, they could have heard the Israeli F-15s flying overhead on the way to bomb the power plant. But through a cyber attack, the Israelis were able to turn off the Syrian air defense. That's cyber war. So that is, that's the future in cyberspace. More and more sophisticated crime, more hacktivist groups engaging in cyber attack, more cyber espionage, a more sophisticated cyber espionage, and eventually, perhaps, cyber war. So, what should we do about all that? How do we get from cyber war to cyber peace? How do we make cyberspace more secure again? I have some ideas. We need a lot more, and we need safer and better technology. But let me, let me quickly give you some ideas about what we might be able to do. For cybercrime, what we're proposing in the book is that we say to these cyber sanctuaries, here's the standard we want you to live up to. Here's the international standard of good behavior in cyberspace. And if you violate that, there will be, sanctuary, there will be sanctions. You don't, you don't have a right to connect to the United States. You don't have a right to connect to France or Germany. If you're a bad citizen in cyberspace, Romania or Belarus or Russia, you will, after lots of warning, if you're not cooperative, you'll be cut off. You'll be disconnected. Reasonable idea? It's at least an idea. For cyber war, what we suggest in the book is two things. Number one, an international negotiation, a peace negotiation, to come up with arms control regimes to prevent cyber war. But we also suggest that before the United States starts engaging in cyber war, we ought to be able to defend ourselves. Today, if a nation were to attack the United States in cyberspace, if they went after the power grid or the banking system or any of the private companies on which we rely, the government won't defend them. Under the current laws, the government won't defend them. That big cyber command we have, it's only instructed to defend the Pentagon. It's not instructed to defend Citibank. It's not instructed to defend the electric power grid. One of the things President Obama has proposed in new legislation is that the government would have the right if the companies agreed, to defend the private companies against attack. Now think about it. How can you expect private companies to be able to defend themselves against sophisticated nation states that are attacking in cyberspace? 
I use the analogy, let's say it's 1961 again, and John Kennedy's president, and Russia has hundreds of bombers, and we know that if a war happens, those bombers are going to come over and bomb our steel plants. Can you imagine Kennedy calling up the head of U.S. Steel in Pittsburgh and saying, you know, your plant may be a target for a future Russian attack with bombers. So you, U.S. Steel, you ought to go out and buy yourself some fighter planes. That's what the government is forced to say now under the current law. It's forced to say to the electric power companies and the train companies and the pipeline companies, you guys better do something to defend yourselves because you could be attacked. That's crazy. We need to pass legislation, and the legislation is in the Congress. Congress, as you know, doesn't do anything anymore. But, <laughs> but someday, they might decide to pass this legislation, which would allow the government to defend private companies that run critical infrastructure. Until then, I suggest that you obey the three laws of cybersecurity. And I trust you know what those are. No? All right. The three laws of cybersecurity, until we can fix it, are number one, don't have a computer. <laughs> okay, well, all right. Some of you need a computer. All right. So, number two, if you have to have a computer, don't turn it on. <laughs> That's not going to work either? No. All right. Well, then the third and final law of cybersecurity. If you have to have a computer and you have to turn it on, don't plug it into anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Dick. That was great. Um, so you'll take a few questions? Please. Could the E and CHU also apply to electronics, as in electronic voting systems? Well, from what I've been able to <coughs> learn about electronic voting systems, they are like most of cyberspace, and that is hackable. Uh, I would feel very uncomfortable with any form of electronic voting that didn't have a paper backup. Uh, in other words, so that there should be some document that is created when you vote that you can identify personally with you and they can be counted. Uh, pure electronic voting, I think, is, a, is an invitation uh, for manipulation. Would that count as hacktivism? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it would count as hacktivism. It uh, might also count as a felony if you get caught. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what will it take to escalate commercial cyber theft to a military conflict with a foreign country, perhaps China? That's well, very interesting. The Pentagon said this year for the first time that we reserve the right as a nation to use regular military force in response to a cyber attack. Now, that immediately got played wrong in the press, and the press said, Pentagon promises to bomb hackers. <laughs> Not exactly what they said. What they said was, if there is damage done to our nation as a result of cyber activity, and if that damage had been done, that level of damage had been done in some other way, like a bomb, we're not going to look at how it happened. We're not going to say, oh, it's just cyber, it's not a bomb. Uh, therefore, since it's only a cyber attack, we'll only respond with a cyber attack. What the Pentagon said was, uh-uh, if you do serious damage to our country through a cyber attack, you could be looking at a missile coming down your chimney. We're not, we're not going to play by any rules that say, just because it was a cyber attack, we have to respond with a cyber attack. And that, that is a big change, and a public change in U.S. policy that just happened. Yeah, I guess that... The question might be, at what level would a commercial attack, a billion-dollar theft, uh, does it take a $10 billion theft? Well, I, I think, you know, if you attack the... There are three power grids in the United States, the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnect, and Texas. 
You don't have to make this stuff up. <laughs> um, I think if you attack the commercial power grid, it's all private companies, if you attack the eastern power grid and took it down, that's attacking a commercial entity. Uh, if you threw the, the eastern half of the United States into, into a blackout, uh, and you could do it in a way, by the way, that you can't just go back and turn it back on. You can do it in a way that permanently damages the transformers and generators, and so the power grid's down hard for weeks or months. Uh, if that were done, even though the, the companies are private companies, I would consider that an attack on the United States. Hmm. Um, actually, I want to follow this question a little bit further. Uh, suppose some pharmaceutical company develops a cancer drug mm -hmm. that works on all cancers, uh, and somebody else steals it. Well, you know, I don't know that that's an act of war. Right. Uh, it's an act, certainly, of economic espionage. Um, but I don't, for me, a, an act of war is destruction, damage, or disruption on a large scale. Uh, and the kind of things that could be done with bombs, uh, that kind of destruction, damage, or disruption, I think, is war. Okay. Does domestic surveillance really make us more secure? Um, and how do you balance surveillance with individual privacy? Some domestic surveillance, I think, makes people more secure, and, and some is, is unproductive. And let me, let me distinguish what I mean. There's domestic surveillance that is putting cameras on street corners and putting up signs that say to everybody, there are cameras. It turns out, in a lot of instances, not in all cases, but in a lot of instances, that really drops crime. And I know in the case of Baltimore, uh, where they put these camera systems in downtown and crime dropped through the floor, that some of the lower class uh, neighborhoods nearby demanded cameras. And some of the housing projects, residents got together and demanded cameras. And the mayor, uh, at the time, was astonished that people wanted these cameras. And then he met with them and they said, look, we know that crime goes down when there are cameras. And we have crime-infested neighborhoods and therefore we want the cameras. Uh, I think that's fine, uh, as long as everybody knows the cameras are there. What I don't think is fine is in, the, there's a case before the Supreme Court now, of surveillance where the FBI was putting transponders on cars and following the cars around with these transponders without a search warrant, without a court order. Uh, and I think that, that kind of violates my notion uh, of the constitutional requirement for a search warrant. Uh, I believe in surveillance is fine if you can convince a judge that there's probable cause. And I don't like the government doing things, wiretapping or putting transponders on cars, if they haven't convinced a judge. How at risk is our mostly digital financial system? Well, of all the sectors of our economy, the financial services sector is probably the most secure, because they've got the most to lose. Having said that, uh, the former director of national intelligence says, publicly, um, that he believes the U.S. financial sector could be crashed by a malicious cyber attack. Uh, I wasn't too sure that that was true until I noticed this year that the NASDAQ admitted it had been hacked. So maybe there is cause to worry about attacks on the financial services sector, too. You're going too fast for me here. You want longer <laughs> answers? Yeah, give me a longer answer on that one. I just lost my place. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, somebody just hacked into my thing here. <laughs> um, if we know of a cyber spy in another country, can't the U.S. catch, try, and convict them? Will cyber crime fo uh, force new international criminal laws? Good question. So there is something, a new international criminal convention that was written by the European Union. It's called the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, 
The United States has signed it and ratified it. Other countries like Russia, Ukraine haven't. Uh, but there is now an international standard on, on cybercrime. Can we trace down the spies and arrest them? Well, no, because they're in these other countries. Uh, we can trace down the spies and the criminals and say, if they ever come over here, we can arrest them. But the thing about cybercrime is they never have to leave their country. They can conduct all the espionage and all the crime and all the break-ins without ever having to leave their country. The larger question that's, I think, lurking behind that is, if we know China is doing this, why don't we do something to China? I think that's worth talking about. I mean, if, if we think China is stealing our intellectual property blind, did President Obama raise that when he met with the Chinese president two weeks ago? I think the answer is no. Uh, if we don't say to the Chinese, hey, Guys, knock it off, or else. You know, I think there's at least a case to be made that you say to them, this is the behavior which we object to, which we think violates international law, and if you don't knock it off, we will do something. And then take out their computers, that they're doing it. Now, here's why you may want to think about that. Because they could retaliate against us. And we, at this moment, cannot defend the United States. Think about that. We cannot defend the United States from a sophisticated cyber attack. So there is an option to say to China, to say to Russia, if you keep it up, we'll blow up your computers with a cyber response. And maybe we should do that. But realize that when you do that, you run the risk that they can come into our networks and derail trains and blow up pipelines and turn off power grids and screw up the financial markets. Because all of those things are in the private sector and the US government can't protect them. Unmanned weapons such as aerial vehicles are typically operated by people stationed in civilian territory away from the battlefield. Can you comment on the redistribution of responsibility for any collateral damage and the potential loss of the basic ethical foundations of military operations? Okay, this is a question about, <coughs> I take it, unmanned aerial vehicles? Yeah. Or as I like to call them, flying killer robots? The United States Predator Fleet has killed people in six countries and has killed about 2,500 terrorists in the last two years. Since Obama became president, he has killed over 2,500 terrorists in six countries using unmanned aerial vehicles, like the Predator. Some people don't like that. Some people say, because it's a robot, that's somehow unfair. Um, I don't like being in a fair fight with terrorists. Uh, and I think if we can, if we can use robot airplanes to kill them, that's fine. But we do, we do need some rules. We need to be very careful that we're actually going after terrorists and we know that they're terrorists. We have to be very clear and careful that we're not engaging in significant collateral damage and killing innocent people in the process. Uh, but frankly, I don't see why it's okay to have an American pilot in an F-16 fly overhead and drop a bomb on a terrorist camp, but it's somehow wrong to have an American sitting back in Nevada with a joystick do it from 10,000 miles away. Uh, frankly, I want that American back in Nevada where if the plane gets shot down, he can still go home and have dinner with his family. And I don't want him put at risk flying over Pakistan or Afghanistan. Uh, I think from intercepted communications of Al-Qaeda and the documents that were found in bin Laden's house, among other things, we know that the damage done to Al-Qaeda in the last two years by the Obama attacks using the Predator have virtually destroyed Al-Qaeda. And I think that's a good thing. <laughs> hmm.
Preventing a plane uh, bombing Pittsburgh means that the government only needs to stop planes from flying overhead. Preventing cyber attacks to the local Pittsburgh uh, Bank of America branch involves government fundamentally changing how Bank of America operates its business. Are we really comfortable with that much government intervention in business? Well, I don't think <coughs> having the government defend banks or defend the power grid on a voluntary basis, if they want to be defended, uh, necessarily means that the government is, is telling the banks how to do their business or how to interfere. I don't think that's interfering in the, in the private sector's activities. If the uh, local electric power company, hey, <laughs> good timing. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> If the lo local electric power company wants the lights kept on uh, and wants the government to defend the local network, I think that's fine. And if they don't, because they somehow object to government involvement, then that's fine too. Have corporations shown any interest in paying for the government to protect them? Most CEOs that I talk to in big companies think they have already paid for the government to protect them. <laughs> <laughs> It's called taxes. But then again, a lot of companies, I've noticed, don't pay taxes, so I... <laughs> Many universities, such as you or I, accept money from China for cultural programs. Should the universities remove themselves from these relationships? No, look, I, I, I think the United States needs to get closer to China. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, China is going to be the new enemy. Well. China will be the new enemy if we keep saying that. We can talk ourselves into a self-fulfilling prophecy here. Uh, I believe what we need is greater cultural exchange with China, greater communications with China, more opportunities uh, for them and we to get to know each other and be even more dependent upon each other. Uh, but as part of that relationship, we have to be very clear where the red lines are. Why has there been so little movement towards asymmetric secrets, such as RSA-style signatures for credit uh, card authentication? You may have answered this one already. I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll go on to another one. Do you sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> A lot better now than when I was in charge of this stuff in the White House. <laughs> uh, whoops, wait a second. <laughs> hang on, hang on. I'm in charge. I'm in, I've got it. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. If we are so vulnerable, there must be there must not be many people who want to harm us. If we are so yeah, no, I get that question. Um, <laughs> if 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 I'm right, and all the other experts are right, who say that America is very vulnerable to cyber attack, why hasn't that attack taken place? Oh, right, got it. Good. And the answer to that is, it is taking place every day. That cyber espionage I'm talking about is happening every day. What isn't happening every day is somebody blowing up the power grid or blowing up the pipelines. And the reason for that is simple. It's motivation. There is a very clear motivation as to why people engage in cyber crime and why people engage in cyber espionage. It's not terribly clear right now why a nation would want to blow up a pipeline in the United States or hurt our banking system. Uh, someday the political circumstances might be that a nation state will want to do that. You know, there have been a lot of reports in the last month or two that things are blowing up in Iran. Apparently pipelines and refineries in Iran have blown up at a rate this year five times normal. Now, it could be someday some nation would want to retaliate against the United States for something that it thought the United States did. But you've got to have motivation. And so far, the motivation is motivation for cyber crime and cyber espionage and not for cyber war. By the way, the difference between cyber espionage and cyber war, technically, is a few keystrokes. Because if you're in the network, if you can get in the network to do cyber espionage, 
if you have techniques that will get you into that network. It's just a few more keystrokes to give a network bum commands that will cause things to go poof. How do you stay current on these topics now that you're outside of the intelligence? Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we'll take one more. Um, should we take one more or a couple more? More. More. Are you okay for more? Two more. Two more. Two more. I've got to find them now. Um, uh, this one's, uh, that's, a, that's a boring one. <laughs> Do our, do our cyber police ever have a chance of getting ahead of the increased complexity and scale of future attacks? I think it's very difficult for the FBI or local police um, because if they get really good at it, they can figure out how the attack took place after the fact. And if they get all the search warrants they need to search through servers and trace the attack as it bounces all the way across the country, they're ultimately going to find it ends up in a jurisdiction where they can't go. Uh, it's true there's some cyber crime that occurs in the United States and from the United States, but the big crime occurs from outside the country. And even if the FBI gets really great, uh, they're not going to be able to do much about that. That's why I think you need a diplomatic, a diplomatic solution. There's one question that normally comes up and it hasn't, and so I'll, if I may, I'll ask it. <coughs> is that the second one? That's the second one. <laughs> and that is, uh, what should you do with your own computer? Use it. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's very, very difficult for you as a home user to stay current with your antivirus software, but you should try, to stay current with your um, system patches from Microsoft uh, or, or Apple, but you should try. But I don't want you going home tonight and saying to the neighbors, you know, I heard this scary guy talking about cyber security. And all that Christmas shopping that you were going to do online, you know, <laughs> better drive to the mall. No. Um, the targets here with a few exceptions, aren't you? Yeah, they may try to steal your identity and they may try to steal your credit card. But that, in the end, won't cause you a big problem, individually. Uh, the targets are our companies, our laboratories, our research universities, uh, and our government institutions. And unfortunately, they turn out, for all the money that they spend trying to defend themselves, the attackers are so much better than the defenders right now that all those big institutions are about as vulnerable to attack as your home computer is. So don't worry about it. Go online, buy your Christmas goods <laughs> online, and have a great Christmas. <laughs>